Nietzsche's work is centrally concerned with health, sickness, biology, and the body. Many people believe that Nietzsche's preoccupation with these concepts can be explained by his own struggles with illness. This is at least partially true. His chronic illness undoubtedly shaped his perception of the world. But I'm not convinced this is the full story. It fails to consider the world that Nietzsche was living in. Indeed, Nietzsche lived in a world that was becoming increasingly medicalized. During his lifetime, there was a revolution in the medical sciences. The advances in chemistry and laboratory techniques that occurred in the 19th century led to the rise of modern medicine. During this time, there was another revolution, a revolution in man's perception of himself. Darwin's work on the origin of the species popularized the idea that man's nature was continuous with that of animal creation. This idea was at odds with the Bible. According to the Bible, humans were just the same when they were first created as they were now. God had put them in charge over the earth and over all the animals. Instead of seeing humans as stewards or even masters over the earth, Darwin's theory would make them animals just like any other. It should come as no surprise then that concerns about biology, physiology, health and illness permeate virtually every facet of Nietzsche's philosophy. What perhaps is surprising is how little attention this is given by Nietzsche scholars. Indeed, many scholars believe that Nietzsche's references to biology, physiology, health and sickness are mere metaphors that shouldn't be taken literally. Instead, they should be seen as rhetorical flourishes. But I am not so sure. I believe that Nietzsche's work was profoundly influenced by the biological discoveries that occurred during his lifetime. Most scholars ignore, and therefore fail to make sense of, the biological dimension of Nietzsche's thought. This video is centrally concerned with this biological dimension. It will argue that Nietzsche's central project, the transvaluation of all values, was informed by the biological research of his time. He believed that the prevailing ideas of Christian Europe had to be scrutinized in light of various scientific discoveries. When he described himself as a physician of culture, he wasn't speaking metaphorically, as many Nietzsche scholars suggest. Instead, I think he was speaking quite literally. This is how he saw himself. He believed that culture had to be viewed in the same way that a physician viewed a patient. In other words, it had to be viewed from a biological point of view. Nietzsche's project was scientific in its very orientation, and it incorporated findings from the sciences to legitimize its objectives. Once one gives this prominent side of Nietzsche's thought its proper recognition, it becomes easier to understand him. He was a biological visionary who viewed things from a clinical standpoint. This clinical standpoint is the hermeneutical key into every region of his thought. This video is the first of a three-part series on Nietzsche. It will discuss the scientific theories that were popular during Nietzsche's lifetime and how they influenced his thinking. It will also discuss Nietzsche's relation to Darwinism. Part two will discuss Nietzsche's conception of health. It will revolve around the culture that Nietzsche considered the healthiest to have ever existed, namely ancient Greece. Part three will discuss his conception of sickness. It will talk about the decline of ancient Greece and Nietzsche's critique of Judeo-Christianity. Nietzsche lived during the second half of the 19th century. This was the time of great scientific advance. It was not, however, an optimistic era. This century began with an abundance of optimism. Enlightenment thinkers were convinced that advances in science, philosophy, and politics were leading to societal progress. But the opposite view became popular among thinkers and physicians towards the end of the 19th century. Indeed, they became convinced that the rapid urbanization and industrialization that had taken place during that century might actually be leading to decline, decadence, and degeneration. The large amount of people living under terrible conditions in cities such as London and Manchester seemed to point to the possibility of a future nation made up of weak and unhealthy individuals. In 1885, for example, the British physician Sir James Cantley observed, The close confines and foul air of our cities are shortening the life of the individual and raising up a puny and ill-developed race. It is beyond prophecy to guess even what the rising generation will grow into, what this empire will become after they have got charge of it. Cantley's words appear to have been validated during the Boer War. 
when Britain struggled to find healthy fighting men. Indeed, 60% of the men that applied to fight failed to meet recruitment standards, even after those standards were lowered. The fact that great industrial towns had higher rejection rates than their rural counterparts seemed to confirm Cantley's fears that urban life had become hazardous to the well-being of the nation. This fear was exacerbated by England's declining birth rates. During the Victorian era, the average family had between five and six children. During the Edwardian era, this figure almost halved. This decline was seen as another manifestation of waning racial vigour in the public's mind. In addition to physical degeneration, many people at the turn of the 20th century became concerned about sexual decadence. The last decades of the century were dominated by controversies over prostitution and sex scandals involving literary celebrities, such as Oscar Wilde. Complaints about decadence are, of course, as old as civilization itself, and the conviction that one is living in an age of irreversible decline is hardly unique to Victorian or Edwardian England. To quote Swinburne, each century has seemed to some of its children an epoch of decadence in national life and moral or material glory. Each alike has heard the cry of degeneracy raised against it, the wail of emulous impotence set up against the weakness of the age. What distinguished the complaints of the late 19th century from previous centuries was the biological explanations of decline, The development of clinical medicine, the rise of scientific empiricism, and the popularization of evolutionary biology led people to perceive the degeneration of European society as a biological rather than cultural phenomenon. In previous eras, social pathologies such as alcoholism, sexual perversion, crime, insanity, and prostitution had been seen as religious problems to be dealt with by priests and theologians. The late 19th century saw them as medical problems to be dealt with by physicians. Talk of evil and immorality was replaced by talk of sickness, pathology, and degeneration. Some of the most popular writers on the topic of degeneration were Charles Darwin, Francis Galton, Cesar Lombroso, and Max Nordau. We will take a cursory look at each of these writers in order to better appreciate the intellectual climate that Nietzsche was living in. Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, ushered in a new evolutionary worldview. This worldview suggested that human and ape shared a common ancestor, and that humans had evolved over time into something far more advanced than this common ancestor. Darwin did not believe evolution was inevitable. Indeed, under certain circumstances, he believed that humans could devolve, with both individuals and nations regressing to an earlier stage in their development. To quote his book, The Descent of Man, If various checks do not prevent the reckless, the vicious, the otherwise inferior members of society from increasing at a quicker rate than the better class of men, the nation will retrograde, as has occurred too often in the history of the world. We must remember that progress is no invariable rule. This idea was taken up by Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who argued that certain races were less evolved than others. He argued that an atavistic skull was indicative of racial retrogression. The word atavism derives from the Latin word atavis, meaning ancestor. When Galton describes a skull as atavistic, he is suggesting that it has more immediate relation to our ape ancestors. Galton argued that man had managed to evolve considerably, but had done so largely by accident. To quote him, Man has already furthered evolution very considerably, half unconsciously, and for his own personal advantages, but he has not yet risen to the conviction that it is his religious duty to do so deliberately and systematically. Galton created the field of eugenics in an attempt to do exactly this. He believed that the progress of man could be brought about through physical means, which is to say, food, exercise, environment, and selective breeding. Another person who studied skulls extensively was the Jewish criminologist Cesar Lombroso. Lombroso believed that man did not become a criminal, but was born one. He argued that a set of identifiable physical abnormalities, especially cranial or facial deformities, were indicative of criminal tendencies – 
The degenerate criminal's nature was stamped on the ugliness of their face and reflected in their atavistic skull. To quote his book, Criminal Man, Born criminals programmed to do harm are atavistic reproductions of not only savage men, but also the most ferocious carnivores and rodents. This discovery should not make us more compassionate toward criminals, as some claim, but rather should shield us from pity, for these beasts are members of not our species, but the species of bloodthirsty beasts. The concept of degeneration did not only impact 19th century discourse about sociology and criminology, indeed it also impacted people's conception of art and culture. In the introduction to his notorious 1892 book, Degeneration, the Jewish journalist and physician Max Nordau declared, Degenerates are not always criminals, prostitutes, anarchists and pronounced lunatics. They are often authors and artists. With these fateful words, he launched into a critique of the most celebrated representatives of the cultural avant-garde, including Wagner, Zola, and Wilde, branding their art atavistic and regressive, a symptom of the epidemic of degeneracy and hysteria he saw plaguing late 19th century society. These thinkers were mentioned only to highlight the intellectual climate that Nietzsche was living in, Religious and cultural explanations of decadence were being supplanted by biological ones. Prostitutes, criminals, the insane, and even avant-garde artists were viewed as degenerate throwbacks rather than heretics, heathens, and sinners. Many physicians of this time were convinced that these degenerate throwbacks could be identified by their deformed skulls and protruding drawers. I'm not suggesting that Nietzsche agreed with all or even most of what these writers said. Indeed, with the exception of Francis Galton, it is not even clear that he read them. Instead, I am suggesting that he grew out of the same milieu. Like Darwin, Galton, Lombroso, and Nordau, he believed that biology had extraordinary explanatory power. To quote the German philosopher Gunther Abel, It is undeniable that Nietzsche's physiological chemical manner of thinking not merely in vocabulary, but in many substantive questions, indicates a clear connection to biology as well as the physical sciences of his day. This connection is perhaps most clearly articulated at the beginning of Nietzsche's work, The Genealogy of Morals. He begins this work by arguing that the originally suspicious relationship between philosophy, physiology, and medicine must be transformed into the most cordial and fruitful exchange. To quote him, every table of values, every thou shalt known to history or the study of ethnology needs first and foremost a physiological elucidation and interpretation rather than a psychological one, and all of them await critical study from medical science. In other words, morality, culture, and religion must be viewed from a medical point of view. I believe that Nietzsche maintains this medical outlook throughout his books. He views cultural matters from the perspective of a physician. Like other thinkers of his time, he is concerned with sickness and health, rather than good and evil. Nietzsche believed that modern Europe was sick. Indeed, he described it as a gigantic hospital. Hospitals require physicians, and this is how Nietzsche saw himself. He was a physician of culture, who set himself the task of diagnosing Europe's ills. This begs the question, what did Nietzsche believe had made Europe sick? The answer, in short, is the foundational values of European man. He believed these values had their roots in ancient Greece and Christianity. This is why Nietzsche said, I am dynamite. He believed in the destruction of everything men have heretofore respected and loved. Nietzsche sought to destroy European values because he thought they had become pathological. But they had not always been thus. Indeed, Nietzsche believed that European civilization had produced the healthiest culture to have ever existed, namely ancient Greece. This begs the question, what made Greece healthy and how did it become sick? In order to answer these questions, we must first understand Nietzsche's notion of the will to power. Nietzsche was deeply influenced by Arthur Schopenhauer's work, The World as Will and Representation. First published in 1818, this book outlines Schopenhauer's concept of the will to life. Schopenhauer believed that the universe and everything in it was driven by a primordial will to life. Human behavior was driven by the desire to avoid death and procreate. 
This desire was irrational, according to Schopenhauer. Life is characterized by pain and suffering. The only reason people endure it is because they are biologically programmed to do so. Similarly, Darwin believed that all human behavior was driven by the instinct of self-preservation. Humans were naturally programmed to both preserve and propagate themselves. Like Schopenhauer, he believed that life was characterized by a brutish struggle for existence. Like both Darwin and Schopenhauer, Nietzsche believed that human behavior was driven by a primordial biological force rather than reason. He also believed that man's nature was continuous with that of animal creation. Despite these similarities, he was not a Darwinist. Indeed, he had major disagreements with Darwin. I will focus on only two of these disagreements, namely Darwin's explanation of altruism and Darwin's idea that man was driven by a desire to preserve himself. Darwin, like many other Victorian intellectuals, had come to question the Christian faith. Not only did he question Christian metaphysics, he also questioned Christian ethics. Indeed, his notion of fitness appeared at odds with Christian compassion for the weak. He argued that man had evolved by overcoming weaker specimens. In other words, progress occurred through the extermination of weaker life. To quote him, From the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. This idea appears to be fundamentally at odds with altruism and compassion, And yet, Darwin did not completely reject these things. Instead, he argued that the altruistic virtues promoted by religion had been selected for over time because they had resulted in superior tribal cohesiveness. To quote him, When two tribes of primeval man living in the same country came into competition, if the one tribe included, other circumstances being equal, a greater number of courageous, sympathetic, and faithful members who were always ready to warn each other of danger, to aid and defend each other, this tribe would without doubt succeed best and conquer the other. In other words, altruism can be explained on evolutionary grounds. It offers the group a competitive advantage and has therefore been selected for by nature. Instead of rejecting compassion for the weak, he provided a secular rationale for it. Like a good Victorian, he is uncertain of his theology, but strong in his moral faith. He believes that the norms of Christian civilization might still be retained despite the divine source of their authority having been abolished. Instead of rooting these norms in a divine source, he tries to root them in science. But Nietzsche views this as intellectual cowardice. If God is nothing but a delusion, then his commandments too are no less fictional. Nietzsche takes the 19th century critique of religion to its logical conclusion. Nothing is more fundamental to his thought than the assertion that if you abandon the Christian faith, you are pulling the right to Christian morality out from under your feet. Christian morality stands and falls with the belief in God. Compassion and altruism are not rooted in evolution, as suggested by Darwin, but in Judeo-Christianity. Nietzsche believes the biblical ethic of compassion and charity obstructs evolutionary progress and leads to degeneration. To quote him, This universal love of humanity is in practice the preferment of everything that is suffering, ill-constituted, and degenerate. True love of humanity demands sacrifice in the best interests of the species. In addition to disagreeing with Darwin's explanation of altruism, Nietzsche disagreed with Darwin's idea that man is driven by the desire to preserve himself and procreate. According to Nietzsche, the fundamental motive of living things is not self-preservation. Instead, living things are motivated by the desire to become stronger. We do not instinctually want to preserve ourselves, but to grow and achieve greater power and superiority. This is a point that Nietzsche makes repeatedly throughout his works. In Beyond Good and Evil, he writes, Physiologists should think before putting down the instinct of self-preservation as the cardinal instinct of an organic being. A living thing seeks to discharge its strength. Life itself is will to power. Self-preservation is only one of the indirect and most frequent results. In short, let us be aware of superfluous teleological principles, one of which is the instinct of self-preservation. In his unpublished notes, he wrote, There is neither an instinct of self-preservation nor an instinct of species preservation. And again, in Will to Power, he wrote, A living thing seeks above all to discharge its strength. 
self-preservation is only one of the results thereof. In short, a healthy organism will neglect caution and court danger in an attempt to expand itself. If expansion and growth are not available to said organism, it will often choose death. This idea is best demonstrated by the fact that many animals refuse to breed in captivity. Likewise, humans will often choose death before dishonor and slavery. If all life strove for mere survival and reproduction, what would explain this fact? According to Nietzsche, it is not all life that strives for mere survival and reproduction, but only botched life. The desire to merely preserve oneself is a sign of sickness. In other words, a man that is not concerned with the shape or condition in which he lives, provided only that he survives, is sick. The healthy, by contrast, seek to expand themselves. They often do this to the detriment of their own personal survival. In contrast to the healthy, we have the last man, which can be interpreted as a caricature of man as described by Darwin, one who avoids danger and seeks preservation, base personal gratification, individual survival, and hopes for a long and uneventful life. These types survive not on account of any superior merit, but because they do not have sufficient health to pursue greater power. They consider their survival a virtue, but this is nothing more than their inability to live dangerously in pursuit of expansion. To better understand Nietzsche's conception of health and sickness, we must turn to historical examples. We will begin with the culture that Nietzsche considered the healthiest, namely the Greeks. In the next part of this series, we will discuss what made Greece healthy, strong, and beautiful, according to Nietzsche.